This final message of this series called Financial Fitness, um, I, I figured I want to do a, a, a recap of what we've covered over the last four messages and to reinforce some key truths. And uh, if you missed some of the messages, they're all on YouTube. And I'm so thankful we've been able, I've just been thrilled that I've been able to do five messages in a row uh, for this month of, of June. And it's a subject um, that I feel passionate about, and not just theoretically, but practically, because I know that what I'm sharing and have been sharing, uh, we've made work. Kathy and I have made work in our lives over the past 40 years. And uh, so today I want to centre my thoughts on to be financially fit, you need a strong giving heart. And, um, you know, giving is a big subject in the Bible. Um, it's probably the most talked about value in the Old and New Testament. How many times is hope, faith and love and giving mentioned? Hope, 166 times. Faith, 220 times. Love, loving, loved, 665 times. Giving, give, gave, given, 2,156. Pretty significant. So the Bible talks more about giving than any of these other subjects because giving is the practical expression of faith, hope and love. So sometimes it's hard to define what faith, hope and love is. They're concepts. But when you look at the act of giving, the act of, of getting out of ourselves, it, it gives practical dimension and expression to this. This is why God wants us to excel in this crucial matter about our giving. In 2 Corinthians 8, 7, Paul says this, but just as you excel in everything, we're to do our very best, as I shared last Sunday. Give God your best. That little boy who sowed his fish and his bread, he's almost nothing. He gave God his best, and when Jesus took it and blessed it, it multiplied and fed 5,000 people. But just as you excel in everything, faith, speech, knowledge, earnestness, in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. There are great benefits, folks, in having a giving heart. It has to do with our time, our talents, and our treasure, the totality of our existence. There are some real gains in learning to be unselfish. It works wonders for your heart and for your health. And well-being surveys, if you want to download some well-being surveys that sociologists and uh, do, they, they tell you that giving and health are linked. <laughs> um, you, physically, you're healthier and live longer. Relationally, you're healthier. You, you live more harmoniously with people. Emotionally, you're healthier. Psychologically, you live with less anxiety. The more you are thinking of others and the more altruistic and generous you are. Whereas if a person is stingy and selfish and holds everything to themselves, their love, their kindness, their time and their money, that ill health comes in. See, amazing, really. You'd think, man, it pays. It pays to be generous. It really does good things to you, both in your inner life and your physical well-being. There's a uh, professor named Robert Putman. His book called American Grace, about 600 pages, a very scholarly work by his uh, Harvard professor. And he, he investigated American religion, how religion unites and divides us. Really interesting read. Uh, not, it's an academic read, so it's not an easy one. He's not a believer. But you know what he discovered about believers? All believers. Evangelical, Pentecostal, traditional Christian. He even found across other religions as well that uh, particularly Christians, he said, that believers are more civic. <laughs> They're more concerned about society. They're nicer. Isn't that good to know that you're nice? If you're a believer, you're nicer than non-believers. I, I, I like that. They're more generous. They're more altruistic with their money, their time, their relationships. Greg Sheridan from the Australian newspaper, he's probably Australia's premier foreign affairs correspondent. He's a practicing Catholic, and uh, Greg is a brilliant writer, anything that he writes. Well, he's written a book called God is Good for You. He produced it last year. I've got it. I'm working my way through it. Whenever I'm on a plane, I just work through more chapters. It's a great book. And it basically proves that having God in your life is good for you. Good for your health. Good for your relationships. It's good for, for everyone. So let me list some benefits in relation to, to a strong giving heart. Here are some benefits. One, 
It's a heart that makes me more godlike. And we all want to be more godlike. God is the greatest giver of all. James 1.5 says, God gives generously to all without finding fault. Isn't that good? Doesn't say, well, nah, I'm not going to give to you today because you were unkind yesterday. I'm not going to give to you. No, no, no. He just, he can't help but give. That's his nature. He's a God of love and he expresses his love and kindness by his generosity. If you're going to be like God, you're going to have to learn to give. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Wow. It expresses itself in, in giving. If you want to learn to be a great lover, you've got to learn to be a great giver. If you're a lousy lover, I guarantee you're a lousy giver. And that's in every dimension of life. In every dimension of life. Some of you are thinking that about that one dimension. I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about the totality of life. But it actually relates to that dimension of life too. If you want to be a great lover, you better be a great giver. And uh, sensitive and loving and generous and kind and courteous. And it rebounds back to you in great blessing. Folks, love and giving go together. Every time you are loving and generous, you grow more godlike. 1 John 4 says this, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? So true. So true. As I said, we're going to look at how can we as collective churches, Christian family center churches, really ratchet up what we're going to do with the property that God's provided in Alice Springs. I'm, I'm leading them into, and Ben today is preaching probably this series on generosity. And I went there the other week to launch a stewardship campaign and, and uh, among the people. And so, but we're going to look at how can we be generous, be loving towards them because of the poverty that's there, the spiritual poverty, the relational poverty, uh, some of the difficulties our, our wonderful indigenous people go through. You've you got to, uh, it would, it would, shock you to know what takes place there and so um so how so if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him how can the love of god be in him so you can give without loving but you cannot love without giving secondly it's a, a heart that brings me closer to jesus matthew six twenty one, a very challenging statement he says, where your heart is, is also where your treasure is. So where's your heart, church? Where's your heart, Bill? It's where you put your money. It's where you put your time. It's where you put your talents. It's where you, what you invest in. It's the things we make our biggest investments in. So when it comes to, to finance, it's usually house is usually number one. Car is usually number two. Career. Clothes, our hobbies. Some put hobbies before the house. Don't do that. Some put holidays before the house. Don't do that. Stocks, investments. Hey, money is like a magnet. Wherever we put it, it tends to pull our hearts towards it. These things are not evil. Some are absolutely essential and are necessities. Just don't forget Jesus and the interests of his eternal kingdom. We've just taken up our tithes. We give 10% of our income into God's work so that ministry and mission can occur here in Australia. We've just taken up a missions offering. That 130,000 a year, I'd love us to be able to, to, to raise 200,000, $250,000 to be more generous. And then over the past month, we've talked about, hey, you've got to fix up the home, the campaign. If you didn't get an opportunity to give, don't go today without getting the brochure. If somehow you missed it and you haven't had an opportunity to give, do it. Get involved in what God is doing. This is your place. If this is your spiritual home, it's your facility. And, uh, and so we're wanting to, to see, and I'm so thankful. Uh, I think it was 170 couples and individuals. So that's probably maybe 300 of us from the little kids to the, to the seniors, the pensioners, to those who have got two incomes and are, and are more wealthy than others. 170 contributed over $302,000 to, 
and 50,000 was in cash, which is fantastic. Our goal to do what we want to do is 340,000, which means we're probably, we're just below that. But we also have to reduce indebtedness and we've set a target that as part of the stewardship campaigns, we will reduce that down by 48,000 per year. So it means that uh, out of the 302,000, 150 will go towards debt reduction. So it means what we can do here will be less than what we've anticipated. But 170 people, hey, what if we went up to 220, 230 couples, some of you here? Wouldn't it be great that by the end of today, early this week, we could reach 400,000? It's possible if we all get involved. And uh, when you look at the sums, some people are giving, you know, whether it's $5 a week, $10 a week, $50 a week, some up to 100. Uh, one of our givers has uh, made a contribution of $30,000 over three years. Fantastic, wonderful, wonderful giver. And uh, so those, some are, are contributing significant amounts, but most are giving their small amounts. And I would encourage you, pray, plan, be involved in this. When I give money to Jesus, it's like a magnet. It pulls me closer to him. And so don't forget him and the interests of his kingdom. Your weekly tithes, your missions giving monthly, and this campaign, which is for three years. And so this is the end of our dis talking about this. So this is the opportunity for you to take this and, and act on it. Join the 170 couples and individuals. Be part of it. Don't miss out on what God is doing among us. Let me read one of the most challenging passages in the whole Bible. This will slay you. You can't read it without getting on your face and saying, oh, Jesus, have mercy on me and help me. This is judgment day. This is when we have to give an account of our lives to him. And the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you and, or thirsty and give you something to drink? What are you talking about, Jesus? Because he says, you didn't feed me. You didn't give me a drink. When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and to clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison? What are you talking about, Jesus? And Jesus says, the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Wow. That young boy who's gone to be with the Lord, we supported him in Bible college. I had significant time with him. Pastor Jeremy, far more time. And, uh, and who knows what he's been able to accomplish in that rugged area, the Gulele area of uh, Papua New Guinea. And he was one of these little people. And, uh, you know, we looked after him. And so we must respond to the needs of people. Giving, folks, is spiritual aerobics for your inner life. Hey, I had a... My wife sent me off to get stress tests and blood sugar tests. Oh, you know what, what women are like, they worry about you. So, so I did it. First time ever, they put me on a jolly treadmill and, and, and you know, the cardiologist going, could you go a little bit faster? I said, are you killing me, doc? I mean, it's as fast as I can go. I'm, I'm a little bit unfit, you know, a bit extra weight. And, and uh, anyway, so I did the test and my heart is fantastic. They did the blood test. Hey, get this, my cholesterol is 2.1. Hey. My triglycerides are even lower. Blood sugar levels, really low. Heart rate, blood pressure, 140 over 75. And the doc says, hmm, lose 10 kilos, it'll go to 130. I said, don't, don't say that. No, but so anyway, so I decided with the cardiologist, we spent a bit of money and bought a treadmill. We haven't started using it yet. <laughs> I'm getting Kathy up there first. Hey, because... You've got to get fit on the inside. You've got to get fit in your heart. It's good for the heart. It enlarges your heart and makes it strong. Parents, do you enjoy watching your kids being selfish or being generous? Come on. You love it when they're generous. We love seeing them sharing. When God looks down on you, when your heavenly father sees you giving and being generous and sharing with others. You know, he goes, oh, that's my boy, that's my girl. That's, that's, that's my heart. And you're picking up my heart. My spirit in you is enabling you to be able to do this. You're becoming more like me. God sees it as an act of worship. And when you do this consistently, you're being drawn closer to Jesus and you will grow like him every day, folks. Seriously. Thirdly, it's a heart that frees me to serve the creator above his creation. 
Look, we, we live in a culture that is so materialistic in Australia. And one of the sad things I've seen in the Asia Pacific area, particularly the Pacific, the Melanesian countries that I visit, is as the cities are growing, they're taking the rubbish from the West as well. You know, and you think, oh man, you know, the rotten TV programs and the terrible movies and all the, the, the foods, the, 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 the full of sugar and fat and, and just terrible. They go away from their basic diet and diabetes is skyrocketing and, and um, you just see that uh, materialism, you know, the, the advertising, you know. Eat this, eat that, even though it's going to kill you. you know, make you feel good, give you a sugar hit. And destroying people's lives. Men and women dying in their 30s and 40s from kidney disease because of, because of that. And so materialism, there's a wickedness to it as well, as well as a, a good thing. So we live in a culture in Australia, and these Melanesian cities are, are becoming like Australian cities too. There are many things we, we think we need you've got to realise you're being, you're being so on a false narrative by the advertisers and the marketers. You know, like the thought is, how, you know, how can I ever live without this thing? You can. You can. How do you keep from becoming too materialistic? What's the antidote? It's to give. And, and I loved what uh, Adrian taught us a couple of weeks ago. Are you still here, Adrian? Oh, he's playing hooky today too. Oh, somebody follow him up, please. When he got up and gave his testimony, he introduced a new concept to us, remember? G-R-S. You know what it stands for? Greed Reduction Strategy. Whoa, I like that. I said, where'd you get that from? He goes, I just made it up. Because it hit me one day. Because I can't be greedy and give my tithe at the same time. It challenges me. I can't be greedy and give my mission offering. I can't be greedy and be considering the poor at the same time. It, it's, it's a means by which you reduce greed. That's the antidote. See, the essence of materialism is to get, to get more and more. So every time I give, folks, I'm breaking the grip of materialism on my life. It's a spiritual victory. It's countercultural. Every time I give, I acknowledge my creator above the things that he has created. Yeah. It's true. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Jesus says in Matthew 6.24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Don't buy into the myth that life consists of the things you accumulate. Your net worth and self-worth are not the same thing. It's okay if I don't spend and, and uh, you know, like some people think, well, I won't spend, I'll only save and I won't be materialistic. Not necessarily. For even savers can be stingy and be materialistic and they won't give, they won't be generous. The only antidote to materialism is to give. You cannot serve both God and mammon. In other words, I have to choose what's number one in my life. I loved um, what uh, Lachlan Donaldson shared when he gave his testimony on the Sunday night. Like he's amazing. And when they bought their first house, it was an older house. And so, and as young people today, it, young people tend to want everything straight away. So they bought this place and they bought secondhand furniture. And for those of you that want to know about bargain hunting, make an appointment to see my wife. She's the best bargain hunter in Adelaide. <laughs> You'll spend a thousand bucks on something, she'll get it for you for 50. She'll only take 10% commission, that's fine. <laughs> so if you're smart, you know, buy a dump but a good position, gradually do it up. Fill it up with old furniture. Save, 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 not just pay off the interest, pay off the principal, go for it. And then after a few years, you can, you know, don't go on that world trip. Don't buy that flashy car. And we taught you this in, in the budget seminars about debt reduction and living within your means and planning ahead. And we want to actually set up a budget bureau here in the church. And Dave Washington said, I'll come and train your leaders. You've got a team of people that know how to help people to, to reduce debt. Man, give to Jesus. Don't give to the banks. Give to the poor. Don't give to the moneylenders. And so there are principles by which you can, you can outwork. And now this is, this is really important. Parents can also say, you've got to let your kids see your sacrifice. Let your children see you give. One of the best things last Sunday 
was to see the little kids coming forward. To see that little Edwin and little Grace putting their money in. I checked out what they gave. 800 bucks for three years they're giving. Those little kids. I feel like saying, where do you get that money from? I thought, wow, the parents. It's pretty sharp of the parents. So, so how they're going to get it, I don't know. So I thought, what an example that the parents are sowing into the kids. Kids, just be generous. Be generous to Jesus. Be generous. And uh, so you've got an opportunity, parents, to let your children see you give. They see you make money. They see you spend money. They see you enjoy money. Let them see you giving it away. Tell them. Inspire them. And uh, talk about it with them. Model it. This will build discipline into them. It's a great way to teach your kids not to be selfish, to teach them how to, how to sacrifice. Hey, fourthly, a heart that grows my faith. Sooner or later, you've got to decide this. Can God be trusted with my finances? And can God be counted on to keep his promises? Can God be trusted with my finances? And can God be counted on to keep his promises? Wow, good questions. Look what Solomon says in Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Faith. Honour the Lord with your wealth. <laughs> this is with the first fruits of all your crops. And here he's talking about the tithe. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. So Solomon wasn't stupid. He was the king over a huge empire. He saw this operating in his own life, in his administrators. And, uh, and he says, trust him. God can be trusted with your finances. Can God be counted on to keep his promises? Yes, look what he says here. Malachi 3, this is good. God says through Malachi, the, old, the, the last book of the Old Testament, this prophet Malachi was in the period when Nehemiah and Ezra were rebuilding the temple. This is the post-exilic period. In other words, that they were taken into exile, the children of Israel, into Babylonia and Persia, and then they started coming back to build the temple. And what happened was the people got selfish and forgot God. So God raises up a prophet, Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Now look what Malachi says. What a terrific challenge. He says, you're under a curse. Well, oh, man, don't like that. You're cursing yourselves. You're tying God's hands from blessing you. Who wants to curse themselves? God is good. God is loving. God is good. But why do you want to tie up God's hands from blessing you? The whole nation of you because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe, the 10% into the storehouse. And in our generation, in the New Testament, the storehouse is the church of God where we are called to worship, the place where we belong. That there may be food in my house. And he goes, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. See, God says, I dare you. Can God be trusted with my finances? Yes. Can God be counted on to keep his promises? Yes. Yes, a thousand times yes. Fifthly, it's a heart that invests for eternity. In my first message that I shared on the first week of June and starting the series on financial fitness, I handled the most difficult of all parables, the parable of the unjust steward. steward remember that? Anyone remember it? Remember anything that I said? This is very depressing if I don't get feedback. I know that in three days, you tend to forget 80%. That's why I've produced notes. I've even got a little handout for you with all these scriptures today. Why? Because I want it to stay in your brains for another few days as well. Keep it in your Bibles and read it. But I shared this and, and this, it's a great parable. The scripture, that's a powerful one. Look at this, Luke 16. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. So the parable says, hey, what you give, your tithes, your missions giving, your facilities, to, that's translated into souls in the kingdom of God. And there'll be people that'll be your welcoming committee and say, hey, Helen, great to see you in heaven. And you say, who's this person? And they say, and, and somehow the Lord's going to reveal that it was through your prayers and faith and giving. There's going to be people that'll be our welcoming committee because we have been generous and we put him number one. We've invested for eternity. 
And Jesus goes on to say, so if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who the heck's going to trust you with true riches? God has chosen to use faithfulness in our giving as an acid test of our maturity. We really need to get this, folks. You just cannot take it with you, but you can send it ahead of you. The way you send it ahead is by investing in ways to get more people into heaven. There is no greater investment than the kingdom of God. It's protected. It's proven. It pays great dividends. It has no risks. There's no greater investment. It's an investment for eternity. We're just dumb if we don't do it. But we've got to trust his word. We've got to trust his promises that he'll come through for us. And finally, it's a heart that will rebound blessing. God always blesses those who give to his work. It's stated over and over again in the Bible. We don't give to get, we just give and somehow it comes back to us amazingly. Look at what Solomon said. One man gives freely, yet gains even more. Okay, so here's a guy who may not have much, but he gives and he gains even more. Here's another who withholds, says, well, I don't have enough, I'm going to hold, but comes to poverty. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. This is the law of reciprocal return. Jesus said this in, in Luke 6.38, give, and I read this one last week, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. So what's the measure you're using? I want you to enlarge your measure so you can enlarge the blessing of God upon your life. Not to make you more selfish, but so that you can be more generous on every possible occasion. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 9. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Last week, I saw joy as people were giving. I've been in places where there's been pressured giving and emotional giving, you know, like the big hit. Imagine the first week if I said, this is it. Now, folks, don't leave this place until you sign up. You haven't got time to think. You haven't got time to pray. You haven't got time to process. You haven't got time to plan. Me, when people do that to me, I go, ah, oh, no way. Give me a break. I need time to think. And besides, if I do it and my wife doesn't agree, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so we gave you four weeks. Why? So that we trust you. We don't want you giving out of emotionalism or out of pressure. You think, you pray, you talk, you do your sums. It's not an out. We want you all to be part of it. Seriously because we want the blessing to come back on you as well as the kingdom of God. And so it's very important. Paul says he loves a cheerful giver. Someone who's decided in his heart to give. We've got these, uh, there's a bake sale out there, isn't there? I can't believe how cheap they are, 50 cents for one piece. I've, I've only got pounds in my wallet. Could someone swap pounds with Australian dollars? Because I want to go there and give them 50 bucks. I'll take one little cake. Why? If they're prepared to do all that cooking and they're doing it for free for the kids I'm prepared to give. And I'm going to do it without asking Kathy's permission. There. <laughs> She's not here. She can't stop me. <laughs> you know, the, the, the Old Testament prophet Elijah, I'll finish with this. You, I got a letter this week, last week. Someone said, Bill, you've got to write a book on faith. Okay. Because you've got to just tell all your faith stories. If I did, I'd talk about Elijah, certainly. And I'd talk about Abraham because they're great examples of faith and a few other heroes. But uh, I love Elijah. He's a strange character. He just appears out of nowhere. But God sends him because King Ahab and Queen Jezebel were just wicked. Wicked. I mean, you couldn't find more wicked people. They're like Hitler and Mussolini thrown in one. Bad people. Murdering scoundrels, and he's the king. So God and the people follow them. They won't listen to the prophets. The king's doing illegal things. He's a criminal. It's like Hitler. Churchill said, found in the 30s, he goes, Look, that, he's just a pathological, psycho, a psychotic criminal. That's why Churchill wouldn't have anything to do with Hitler. They're all saying, oh, make, make peace with him and all that kind of stuff. He says, how can he make peace? He goes, I'd sooner, I'd sooner do a deal with the devil than with Hitler. That's what Churchill said. See the film, The Darkest, what's it called? Dark, oh, fantastic film. Anyway, this guy is a Hitler. 
And she's a nasty piece of work. I mean, she's a murderer. So she actually sends a hit squad to kill the prophets. She sets up a Gestapo force, secret police. So the prophets are scattering. They introduce Baal worship into the temple. So God just says, man, and the people are following. They're not rising up in rebellion. The people should have risen up and just got rid of that dynasty, the dynasty of Omri, and put another one in there. And so anyway, God says, well, look, I've got to remind them that I'm God. So he sends Elijah, this wild boy from the, from the Transjordan, across the River Jordan from Gilead. And he comes and says, there ain't going to be any rain for three years. You're all going to die. You're going to starve. And of course, the king doesn't take it. Well, the rain stops. There's a drought. And it's terrible just to, to, to wake the king up and the queen and for the people to rise up. Anyway, so Elijah... He goes into a little ravine called Kerith and God supernaturally feeds him water and then the brook dries up. So he doesn't know what to do. So God says, I want you to go into enemy territory. I want you to go right where Jezebel came from, Phoenicia, just below Tyre. Like what? Go into enemy territory. Go to Zarephath. I've got somebody there that's going to help you. So he goes there. He doesn't know what he's doing. And he sees this woman who's pretty frail. She's picking up some sticks and she's, you know, like pretty depressed and and, she's, and, and he just says, uh, lady, you know, where are you from? She goes, what are you doing? She goes, oh, I'm just going to get some food. I've got just a little bit of flour and a bit of, a bit of oil and I'm going to bake the final food and see how long my, my child will live for. And God speaks to Elijah and he says, why don't you go back and make me a cake? Do something for me. Now you would think she's got nothing. It's like that little boy with the fire. Nothing. She's got nothing. What is this guy asking? God's moving and, and she recognises there's something about this man. It was a word. It was a word from the Lord. And as, and as she does that, as she goes, you know Elijah says, lady, when you start cooking with that flour and that oil, it's never going to run out until the rains come. So she goes back and that's exactly what happened. Look at the scripture. I love the story. It's fantastic. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. She went away and did. She acted on the word. Her feelings would have told her this is crazy land. This is madness. This is irrational. This is what? She went away and did. Obedience doesn't require you have to feel to do it. You don't have to feel all happy about it. I mean, she's depressed, she's down, but the word of God comes to her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. He says, put God first, lady, and make a meal for me and you watch what happens. You step out and trust God. You obey even when you don't have it and you'll see something that's going to, going to rock you, rock the socks off you. You know, the best time to give, folks, is when I'm flat broke because I need God's help. People say, oh, if I'm broke, I can't give. No, no, that's when you should give. I've never stopped tithing from when I was 19 years of age, even when I had it, even when I didn't have it. The temptation is just rob God and just pay yourself more. No, never done that. Just always put God first. I watch my expenses, I'll bring those down. Sometimes there are tough times. <laughs> the best time to give is when you're broke because you need God's help to get out of debt or to get going. It forces you to say, I need to do a debt reduction strategy. I need to do some budget planning. I've got to get myself out of this and we will be able to help you to do that. Secondly, you can't outgive God, you can't. If you put God first, he'll take care of your needs. It's the story of Elijah. And you're going to reap far more than what you sow. So I encourage you today to develop a big, strong giving heart. At the end of this series, financial fitness, I want you to be as fit as you can be. And in that way, there's blessing that comes on your life and, and through your life to so many other people. Can I hear an amen to that? Let's stand together. I'd like to lead you in a prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You know, Muse, as you come up and get ready, we'll sing a song. Because we've got to express our gratitude to Jesus today. 
for the amazing gift of salvation. God gave you his best, Jesus Christ. He showed you what God is like. We have wonderful records, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. He dies on a cross to take away our sin. He's buried, he rises again and sends the Holy Spirit to fill us. Because we can't live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us to understand who Jesus is, to understand what happened at the cross and, and, and what Jesus is doing in heaven for us. He's praying for you. He's ministering from heaven through the Holy Spirit and through his word. And he's speaking today through his word. But are you listening? And are you prepared to learn and maybe unlearn and obey and trust and step out? You've got to face your fears. You've got to look at your lack and say, it's illogical. But like the woman with a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil, she saw the miracle working power of God work. It's worked for me. It's worked for hundreds of people here. It can work for you as you trust Him. He gave us His best, His precious life to save us for eternity. Can we outgive the Lord? Never. But we do it because that's part of our obedience to Him. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You. You challenge us to get financially fit. You speak to us, Lord, about developing a strong giving heart. Help us, Lord, to get fit on the inside as we endeavour to get fit cardiologically in our physical dimension. So Lord, help us to get spiritually, cardiologically fit in our hearts. Help us not to develop, Lord, arteriosclerosis of the attitudes. Will we develop hardness in our attitudes? The plaques develop, blocks that hinder you from working miracles in and through us. Unplug our hearts, Lord. Cleanse us. Help us, Lord, to develop strong, powerful, giving hearts. Not to earn salvation, but because we have received salvation as a free gift, that we now respond, Lord, and we say we give you our hearts. Touch us all, Lord, to to embrace this, for some to embrace the principle of weekly tithing, for some to start giving to missions monthly, for some here today to actually, I'll be part of the, the, the facilities upgrade, I've let it go, but I'll do it. Lord, as they make that decision, guide them, lead them, and may they just find you through this, that their hearts are becoming stronger and stronger.